Welcome, welcome to another episode of Creative Therapy. Look at me publishing consistently another week. You know, not to pat myself on the back here, but I'm going to be real with you guys. Anytime I try to be consistent with something, the pressures that I put on myself to be consistent ironically results in me being inconsistent. So I'm not going to put these deadlines out into the universe because it always comes back to bite me in the butt. But I do realize challenges are healthy, so I'm going to use this as a new challenge for myself to be disciplined in that area of my life because, honestly, I'm not really consistent with a whole lot. And lately, sure, it has been reading. I'll, I'll give myself that. Photography for the last year and a half, I pretty much shoot almost every day. But this new project of mine, this podcast, I am determined to keep up consistently. So we'll see how that goes. So far, so good. This is the second Wednesday in a row. <laughs> and I decided to put these out on Wednesdays because I just love Wednesdays. And uh, Wednesdays are my favorite day of the week. Well, I mean, tied with Sundays. So Sundays and Wednesdays for me are just my days of the week. I don't know. It's just... Wednesdays, I feel like I'm free and I can do whatever I want. And Sundays are just generally pretty chill. The world is your oyster Wednesdays and super chill Sundays. Those are my days. And I would love to hear if you have a favorite day of the week and why that is. Is it because it allows you to be most productive? Does it allow you to be the most relaxed? These things are important. And Especially when we think of creativity, you know, it's essential to allow us a space in order for us to do that and be creative and have that freedom. That actually brings us into the topic of today's episode, which is creating the space to allow for your creativity to flow and getting into that flow state. So let's dive in. So the first idea here is setting the scene, that is creating your physical environment that will hold your creative space. So physically speaking, what can this look like? I'll give you three examples. Number one, that would look like a space in the home that is specifically dedicated to your creative work. It could be a home office if you have one. It could be a corner of a room. Me personally, where I like to do a lot of my writing is on a desk in the corner of my bedroom that is facing outside a window. I am very much a window person. I love sitting next to windows. I love opening up the blinds in the early morning, watching the sunrise as I'm at my desk reading or writing. It's really a beautiful feeling to tune into, and I highly recommend it if you like to wake up early. And if I don't have any windows around me, generally speaking, I will feel trapped, so I choose to work by a window. Now, if you're gonna commit an area in the home to your creative work, It's crucial to keep it as clutter-free as possible because I don't know about you, but okay, there are people who like chaos and I personally like fast-paced environments, that type of chaos, but when I have papers and books and things just stacked up all around me, I really cannot concentrate. I just really can't. When that happens to me, I get mad about all this clutter that's around me and I start going on this cleaning rampage. And not just my desk, but all the areas around it too. I just start organizing and rearranging things. I'm vacuuming. I'm dusting. I'm just getting rid of anything and everything that I can blame as a distraction. So just removing all those things, even if, yeah, it is dust and you're staring at it and you're like, this dust is killing me. I can't focus until this is clean. Go ahead. Do that. Make it happen. Just don't let the cleaning itself get in the way of your productivity. Like, don't allow that to be an excuse to procrastinate, which I am totally guilty of. Just try to keep it as clean and as organized as possible as you go along, and you should be good. The second way to create a physical space for yourself is with a dedicated studio space or office space that is outside the home. I understand that not everybody can afford this, right? However, if it is in your budget, you can find different ways, maybe even cheaper ways of renting out a space by, for example, going through Craigslist, by going through Facebook groups, by going through local community forums online, 
like Nextdoor or OfferUp. People post classified types of ads all the time. And obviously, you want to do your homework and make sure that they're first and foremost legit posts and real people looking for others to rent out their space or share a space where maybe they might take up the office Monday through Thursday and you can have the office Friday through Sunday unbothered for, you know, a really good rate. You can even find cheaper spaces outside of your vicinity. It might be a little bit of a drive if you're willing and able to make that happen. I did have a studio of my own for some time, but it was a little bit of a drive. It was about 20, 25 minutes out. And after a while, it was starting to feel a bit out of the way. And it was becoming a bit of a drag to do all of the back and forth. Um, and um, like if I forgot something or if I had to swing by to just pick something up or drop something off, it felt a little silly to be making that long of a drive. So if I am going to do that again, I'd rather opt for something that definitely does not feel like a trip. Number three on the list would be simply changing up the scene. Personally, I like to go to a coffee shop and I love working out of coffee shops. I tend to go there on days when I personally feel frustrated or blocked creatively. I just like to kind of soak in the ambience. There's something about going to a space that's populated yet working alone. I don't know. I think there's a term for that. I don't know what that is, but it's either it could be the white noise in the background or just the productive vibe within the environment that gets me going. But I will tell you, last week I had to write out this philosophy paper for school and I could not do it at home. Like I already spent a couple of hours on it and I was super blocked, like just staring at that last sentence. I had nothing going on in my head. So I was like, you know what? I need to get it out. So I packed up my stuff and I went out to one of my favorite coffee shops ever. Shout out to The Well in Stockton. And I finished the rest of my essay in literally an hour. And I know this because I literally only had one hour available to be there. So changing your environment to create that sense of freedom for creativity to flow, especially when you know that space is dedicated to that, it just makes it so much easier it's going to allow your productivity to increase and it'll just be so much easier to focus. So those are the different ways to create a space for yourself, but it's also really important to know the type of environment that suits you. As a photographer myself, I love exploring spaces and taking note of how I feel in these places. You might have heard of something called a liminal space, which is an environment that creates a type of unsettling feeling, kind of eerie. And there are other spaces that give energy, that provide energy. For me, I notice that these spaces have a lot of windows and are naturally lit. And then there are others that truly drain me of all my energy and just feel like a super drag to be inside of. So just check in with yourself. Notice what makes you feel good and what doesn't because a space is sensory and it can be a very emotional experience. I'll give you an example. A few weeks ago, I was in Italy, humble brag, walking down a really crowded street. Shout out to Speckinapoli. And I probably butchered the hell out of that, but you know what? We move. So sandwiched in between these two storefronts was a really beautiful doorway that caught my attention and mostly because of how the sunlight flooded it from inside. So I was like, ooh, this is this has to be good, right? I walk in just being curious, wanting to take pictures, and it turned out to be this huge church. And I mean, the grandeur of this church alone just made me feel so emotional and I sat there with these feelings, savoring them because it was just so overwhelming. I couldn't, I can't even put it into words. I was just filled with so much gratitude to be able to be there for the craftsmanship of the architecture, for the history, for the pillars, the marble, for everyone who contributed to preserving it. 
I was just so thankful to be able to experience that. And thinking about it now, I can tap right into those feelings as I speak. And I think that's why I found myself in this architectural era of my photography. I feel the urge to document and preserve these things in my own way so that I can come back to them, uh, to these feelings, and hopefully others can appreciate that as well. I'm actually working on publishing those photos for my trip in a coffee table style book. And so announcements for that will happen soon, hopefully um, to be able to pick up around the ho- around the holidays. So look out for that little plug. So anyway, as you can see, the design of a space can really impact how we feel. If you think about the colors on the walls to how much light comes into a room, the height, the textures, curvature, even down to the temperature, these things do affect our mood and mental well-being. I'm sure you can notice the difference between sitting in an office under fluorescent lighting, yuck, and sitting in a room that's filled with warm lamp light, right? Or the intimacy of a candlelit room. I can even feel a difference with LED light. It just feels artificial and a lot harsher than an incandescent bulb. Noise is also another element to consider. You know, how sound bounces around in a room. I'm a pretty sensitive person, and so crowds and a lot of noise can be really bothersome sometimes, especially in spaces that are supposed to be quiet. Um, I mean, there's a thing such as ambient and environmental noises, right? Like I mentioned with the coffee shop. And those types of sounds are to be expected. And when we think of sound, there are soothing ones and there are dissonant sounds. And this is going to pertain to your individual needs and likes and brain connectivity patterns because everybody is so different. But sounds have these vibrations that have the capacity to soothe uh, and trigger either a fight, flight, freeze reaction. For me, when a space that is supposed to be quiet is loud, it creates such a dissonance. It drives me absolutely nuts because that's, that's all I can focus on. Like being at the library the other day, I'm chilling, trying to read. And there's this group of people that were just talking in normal voices. And I almost lost it. (laughs) I felt like that librarian lady in the show all of that if anybody remembers that show from the 90s where she's screaming at everyone to shut up because in there in the library right but even though she's being super loud herself honestly I wouldn't doubt if when I retire I just become that crabby old librarian lady just being surrounded by books and silence ah, that sounds so good that sounds so soothing see I'm creating this fantasy type of relationship with a space I haven't even experienced in that sense, right? Anyway, as kids, environment contributes so much to our development, our personalities, our views, and we don't have control over that. As adults, however, we can take control over our environment most of the time to shape us for the better. And don't we want to become the best version of ourselves? If we place ourselves in a space that is aesthetically pleasing, we trigger that reward system within us that floods us with positive emotion. And in turn, that calms our breathing, it lowers our heart rate, and reduces stress. When we are in this kind of state, it's easier to learn and easier to create. And aesthetics is so powerful that all we have to do is think ourselves into being somewhere calm, like through meditation or visualization. And our bodies react on a biological level as though we're there. Like with the example I gave of the church, right? So why not create that sacred space for yourself and actually experience it? Reap the benefits of that. So let's take a quick look at a recent study. In 2019, the Google Hardware Design Group produced a live study of their own to document how atmospheres affect our perspectives. And what they did was they created an exhibit for people to experience the concept of neuroaesthetics. It was an immersive experience where people were exposed to different spaces and 
to track that, they wore biomarkers or tools that measure biological activity, a wearable, essentially. And there were three different rooms, each one designed with different furniture, textures, lighting, sounds, and scents to evoke specific feelings. And so participants were encouraged to take their time and just be in each room, soak it all in, right? And what they found between the biological feedback and that the wearables recorded like heart rate, respiration, and temperature, that feedback did not align with what people believed was the room where they felt the most calm. And so it goes to show how the process of our emotions driving our motor movements or physical responses are faster than the processing of our awareness to these emotional responses. So we can walk into a room and already have preconceived notions about a space just based on culture, personal history, and the time and place in which you live, even unbeknownst to us, because they're so deep-seated, and those preconceived notions can distort what we're actually experiencing in real time. So there's a reason why people say, listen to your gut, because it really is trying to tell us something. This is where experimenting by placing yourself in different spaces and jotting down your reactions to them would really help. You know, we're Constantly processing everything around us, 11 million bits a second to be exact. So you can imagine that a lot of the processing happens unconsciously, but our bodies are storing this information. So bring that processing into the conscious and pay extra attention to those types of environments that might be stress inducing because being in that state obviously has detrimental effects to your health, right? We can pick up on tension And being in a prolonged stressful environment can lead to anxiety, to depression, harmful behaviors, and can leave a physiological imprint on our bodies by throwing our hormones out of whack and alter our brain chemistry. It's enough that we're constantly overstimulated with stressors, right, from news and work and all the things. So you can see how crucial it is to create a safe space in which its specific function is to be able to let go and relax and allow the pleasures of creativity of thought to flow. In addition to creating a physical space, um, there is the mental space as well, right, to allow for flow to happen. But I'm looking at the time now, and um, I'm over 20 minutes already, and... I want to keep these episodes bite size, you know, around the 15, 20 minute mark. So I'm going to end it right there and come back to this, pick it up on another episode, and we can discuss how to create the mental space um, for to allow uh, for creative flow um, and the benefits of that. So we'll just save that for another time. I'll end it here. And I want to just thank you all for listening, and hopefully I will catch you on the next one. Thank you.